G'day guys, welcome back to the off-season episode, I want to say six, might be seven. We've got Jackson Hastings joining us again this week. Welcome back, mate. My nice shirt, by the way. Thanks, Guru. Yeah, appreciate it. I uh, got on the bandwagon when I was over there, followed the, the football, as they call it, and um, yeah, I was back in England, so... Jumped on well. the bandwagon, you fucking played for him. Good <laughs> God. <laughs> Matty, what's doing? What's going on, Guru? Um... Yeah, had a pretty pretty good weekend. I stayed up late last night to watch the Tonga Smile game. Before that, I I had a recommendation from some, from someone on the podcast to watch a Ben Stokes documentary, which I thoroughly enjoyed. So I'm a bit tired at the moment. But what was your favourite part of it? Oh, the the part where he got charged for for the punch on, yeah. and then like just how he would not forgive the people. <laughs> that My favourite part about of it. Him. And what I took out of it was how mentally tough he and Brazilian cool. he was. Obviously, the stuff he went through with his own family, his father and that, but yeah. the way he dealt with that media scrutiny, mm. obviously can relate a tiny bit, but like to see his mental toughness and how he bounced back from it, it's outstanding, eh? 100%. If anyone go to Amazon Prime, watch type in Ben Stokes, you won't regret it. Unbelievable. 100. I didn't want to interrupt. I haven't seen it yet. <laughs> I, I have to have a squeeze and do it. Um, now, we're going to, have to talk about ball playing forwards today, our very best of all time. We're lucky enough to have a ball playing forward here <laughs> with us, of course. I'm very keen to see what you come up with here. Yeah, I've got a few different ones. I don't know if everyone will know exactly who I'm talking about on a couple, but there's a couple of boys that I got to play against. I know you two have some, some really good players as well, and uh, they, they're all different in their own right. They all sort of did it a different way, some bigger than others, some more skillful than others, but they all did it very well, so... I'm keen to talk about it. Obviously, since moving position, I've uh, watched a lot more of it and, and tried to learn and pick things up of the, the greats of the modern day, like Isaiah Yo and Victor Radley and people like that too. So pretty keen to talk about it. Uh, if you put your halfback hat back on, mm. what does having a ball playing lock mean to you as a seven? Yeah, it gets you a step wider. You don't have to sort of control the middle. You've got a nine that can do it and you've also got a 13 that can get those big boys around the park. It can get your back rolls involved. A lot without you touching the ball, you can sort of push out the back back of your back row and look down short sides a little bit more. And as I said, just having that person that can link and push everyone a step wider so you get more people on the ball too. So getting the balance right, which is what I've got to learn between touching it too much and, and touching it at the right times and, and when to run and using your big fellas around you, using your props, using your back rolls will actually open up the play for not only your halfback but yourself too. So, as I said, taking a real keen interest on watching Isaiah Yo and, and people like that play and obviously Victor Radley's killing it for England too. So, hopefully if I um, can take a little bit from each one of their games and, and add it to my own game and keep improving and developing in that role. And obviously when we think of ball playing forwards, I think we straight away think of the 13 jersey yep. all the time and vast majority of them are there but I think we have got a couple of front rowers we've thrown in we've got a couple of edge forwards as well so really really keen to get into this one Matty do you want to kick us off with uh, your two mate or your first one yes I'll start us off with uh, Glenn Stewart so I feel that <clears throat> gifty the ball playing lock was like it's been there forever but I think somewhere in the last decade it kind of the lock kind of turned into a prop at some point and now it's now now we know it's back to Isaiah Yo, Cam Murray, Victor Adley, all the people you just said, Jacko. But I think uh, Glenn Stewart, along with another one we'll mention later, is one of the last in that kind of era. Um, I think Manly had such a unique playing style from 2008 to what 2013 when they had all that success, and I don't think they would have been able to have all, all of that success if Glenn Stewart wasn't there and wasn't the link man between the backs and the forwards. He was an unbelievable player. And I think he's, it kind, it kind of showed in that 2011 grand final when, don't forget, he hadn't played a few weeks because he was suspended, uh, the Battle of Brookvale. And he won the Clive Churchill medal. He scored a try. His brother Brett scored a try as well. But his moment in that game came a minute before half time. They're on their own 20 and it's tackled one or two or something. And he puts a little grubber in yeah, for, for Robertson. Like just, just so ballsy, so crazy. They go the length. They, well, no, they don't go the length. They get dragged down and Cherry Evans scores the next play. And they go up 12-2 at half time. Like just such a huge point, turning point in the game. Um, yeah, so that's mine. Glenn, Glenn Stewart. That kick was unreal, wasn't it? I remember watching it um, as a young fella. He played for West Wollongong, my, my local club. My stepdad actually coached both the boys. So sitting back watching the, the grand finals with my stepdad, Smokey, like I remember that play like so vividly. One, to have the balls to actually do it, but two, to be a back rower and have that vision. Like as you said, 
there was a time where every forward just became like a hit-up merchant. And I don't know if he was the one to break the mould, but he was certainly one of the boys that didn't just break the mould, done it to a level where... I remember some games where him and Jamie Lyon used to play six and seven if Kieran oh. Foran and Cherry Evans were out. They didn't even need backup halves because they had two that played just a step wider. And yeah, they had the best combo. Like he, sure. he sort of brought that play in. Like we started doing it as kids where you'd hit... The half would hit the back row early the centre would lead and the fullback would pop out the back. The amount of times that he would get it off Cherry or, or, or Foz and then Jamie Lyon would hit that hole or Steve Maddow would and then uh, Brett would just swing around the back and even put the winger away or score himself. He was um, incredibly tough but incredibly skillful and, and a privilege to watch really. It was unreal with that manly side whenever you saw a middle forward or on third or fourth take yeah. a hit up at the sticks and then you could see them going to the right. You just yeah. thought, oh, fuck, here we go. Yeah. Something's about to be on here and you're right. I, like, I often say... Jamie Lyon, the way that he played, like he was a second 5'8 playing at centre. And, uh, you know, I almost feel like saying he, for a brief period there, he revolutionised the centre position, but no one could emulate it. No. no one could do what he was capable of doing. And you put Gifty on that edge with him. It, it was like you had three 5'8 standing on that side. It was, like a, it was like a tidal wave. Every time, as you said, someone would lay the post or lay that left stick, the whole spine... Plus, Gifty would just swing to that right with with Snake out the back. It was um, I couldn't imagine how hard it would be to defend, especially in their prime when they were all just playing at that le that high elite level when when Manly were just consistently at the top fighting for grand finals. But uh, he was a massive part of it. And I know everyone talks about how good Brett was, and he was unbelievable. But uh, Gifty was just as good, I, th I think, in his own right. And there's a reason why they both played at such a high level. I think with that, with that kick you spoke about in the grand final too, Matty, like we look back and it's such a great moment, but if that kick doesn't work, mm. everyone stands here and goes, you fucking idiot. Yeah. What are you doing? Everyone's so quick to turn. I mean, I often go back to this, the, the grand final this year. Mitch Moses kicks early. I think it was Mitch Moses or Dill Brown. They kicked early for each other. Yep. And, you know, everyone blew up. Blah, blah, and I just sort of thought, fuck, you turn the ball over a metre from the line. Yeah, I don't mind it. You do something different. I, I remember watching you in the early part of your career where it was probably a pass you could have thrown – you know what I'm talking yeah. about. Was it Sean, Kenny Dow, yeah. SKD? Yeah. And, and, and you chipped instead. And I just remember sitting there going, what the fuck is this bloke doing? Yeah. But if you've got the confidence to be able to get it from A to B as quick as you possibly can, yeah. like Glenn Stewart did, like you did in that moment, it's unreal to watch. I don't know. Like, it's just a spur of the moment. Like, uh, you've got to live and die by your decisions, mm -hmm. especially in rugby league. Obviously, uh, if that didn't come off and it got deflected and, and it got charged down and the opposition scored, game could be completely different. But... I suppose you do all the hours of the preseason, go through the year, and if you practice it and you train it, and it comes off on game day, then all the hard work sort of pays off. But you gotta have a bit of self belief, and um, as I said, he'd been around for a long period of time. He was one of the leaders of that team, if not the leader, and um, come up with a massive play at the right time. I was having a look back at his career. So from two thousand and three to two thousand and six, he plays a grand total of nine of uh, sorry nineteen games. So in four years, he played nineteen games of footy. 2007 to 2008, he plays 52 games, he plays in two grand finals, he wins a comp, and he plays for the Kangaroos. Fucking insane. It's impressive. What was he, what was he out with? Uh, I'm, I, no, I, I think he was just in and out of the team oh, in the right. early parts of his career. Yeah, I, I don't think he hit the ground running like we... Like, oh, I would have thought he would have, yeah, just right. thinking back, just having a look at it. It was crazy. Um, yeah, Clive Churchill medal, 2011, unbelievable stuff. And he obviously, you know... Played the vast majority of his career at the Manly Seagulls. I think he played 203 games, 185 at Manly. Finished with South Sydney. Wasn't quite the best of Glenn Stewart that we ever saw, but fuck, there was a lot of excitement about that move, wasn't there, Matty? Oh, I was pumped when, when we yeah. signed him. Obviously, it, he wasn't who he was at Manly. I think that Manly, his last like mad year at Manly was 2013. I think the next year he might have been a bit injured and then he went to South. Um, but that 2013 year, he, he finished the year with the most... Trisis of any lock. I, I was looking at highlights this morning and it was just like a random game against the Warriors and they won, tw they scored 27 points and he had a hand in every try. Yeah, so like, cool. he's just, he's just crazy. There's something, there's something really, like for me, um, something really special and unique and something so good to watch about a big guy that can actually play with the footy. Mm. Like, can actually, you know, he's back to use the ball as like a halfback. And I don't know, as I said, I don't know if he changed it or he was the one to bring it back, but he certainly took it and ran with it and, and made it his own. And uh, whenever you think of Glenn Stewart, you think of toughness first, and but skill skill and ability second. And um, 
when he went to the Rabbitohs, I don't know if that suited the way he played. I think they may have played a completely different style to what he was used to. And um, it was a shame that he couldn't finish a one-club player and finish with his brother. That would have been pretty cool and pretty special too. But um, privileged to watch him play. And I was lucky enough to play one or two games against him as well. It's pretty crazy. Like when I look back at his career, and I, like in my mind, Glenn Stewart was the dominant ball playing forward for what felt like 10 years. Yeah. How many rep games do you reckon he played? How many games do you reckon he played for New South Wales? Ah, here we go. You got me on the overs, I'm unders just, last time. you into another I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say seven to ten. He played five. Oh, yeah. That, I that, thought he would have played much more than that. That's surprising because I remember when New South Wales, I used to – oh, I love watching New South Wales play. I'm, I'm a blue, obviously, from, from Wollongong, so I love watching the Blues play. But I remember like when we used to have him, Luke Lewis, Anthony Watmo, Greg Bird, like that leg speed and punch through the middle – I used to be so good. I know we didn't necessarily always win, but to watch those, there was obviously more, but those four in particular, like come off the bench or start or interchange each other and the amount of leg speed and skill that we had through the middle was was outrageous. And that just goes to show how good the Queensland side was. But I definitely thought he would have played more than five origins. Yeah, 2009 he played game two and game three. 2011 he played game three. And then 2012 he played game one and game two. So he never even played a whole series. I don't know if it's injury affected or... Whatever it might be, do you, do you have any more info on that, Matty? No, I was looking at this this morning. I was just a surprise, but I yeah, I didn't look beyond that. It, 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 even Kangaroos, like he, he only played five games there, and yeah, four of them were, were in one World Cup. Yeah, right. So I thought he would have played a lot more footy, and I actually I actually found that as a bit of a trend with some of these guys that I was looking at. They played a lot less rep footy than, than, than what I, I thought they would have. Uh, but a champion player, gifty. Anything else to add on him, Matty? No, nah, not really. I think I guess I'll just go into my into my second player now. Yeah, sure. um, this guy is one of my favourite players of all time. Um, I know him through Origin Camp, Wade Graham. He he is just the complete package. If we go back to the start, he he debuted in high school as a 17-year-old, I'm pretty sure, at, in the halves. Um, played, you know, when, when he signed with the Sharks, he played 5'8 in that year. And then Shane Flanagan was like, I'm going to throw him to the forward pack. Um, <clears throat> what that did was just create another 5'8 on the field. But as we know now, Way Graham is one of the toughest motherfucking players to play the game. Yeah. So you got everything in one. And then you just got like 2016, for example, when Benny Barber was the major threat on this side. And as we know, Benny Barber, when he's got... When, he, when he's got three people to hit, he's always going to take the right option. And when he's the biggest threat, if you stop worrying about Wade Graham for a second, suddenly Wade Graham's going to put a kick in and force a drop out. Or Wade Graham's going to put a short pass in and put his centre through. Like that left side in State of Origin, uh, uh, sorry, not State of Origin, in the 2016 Sharks Premiership year, he was so integral to that. But my favourite Wade Graham moment was in 2019. So he did his ACL in the in a game against the Roosters in the finals in 2018, he came back against Para, and obviously, as we know, ACLs yeah, bitch to come back through. Played what half a game against Para, played another game, and then Freddie calls him and goes, "I need you for Origin." Blues are down one nil at this point, so he, he he gets picked as an edge back rower. He's on the bench. Cleary goes down at half time, and it's pouring rain in Perth. Way Graham comes on the field. Bang, sets up a try. Bang, sets up a try. Like, he yeah. just he just had absolutely everything in him. Boyd Cordner, obviously, an absolute staple to that left. Like, he, he had a mortgage on that left side for origin. If he wasn't there, Wade Graham probably would have started there more. But, I mean, you'd rather them both in the team, so it doesn't really matter. But, yeah, Wade, Wade Graham, one of my favourite, favourite players. Oh, I'll never forget that night. That we, that they were wearing one of those um, unique jerseys. That yeah, it was the dark was navy, navy dark jersey. Navy, where, yeah. The one where Turbo scored a hat-trick. Yeah, 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 fuck, he had a good game that night, Wade. And yeah. obviously it was Brad Fiddler that um, that picked him. Tell me Freddie didn't have a soft spot for a kid from Penrith. Yeah. It was tough as fucking nails and could ball play with the best of them. That's the one thing I do admire about him. Like you talk about uh, watching him play 5'8", um, the skill he had. I love when the Sharks utilise him on that two-pass kick, bring the winger up, grubber it in behind so the mm. chasers can get down and isolate a fullback, especially if they're small. Obviously Flano had an idea in his head and just used it to perfection nearly every week. I, like, I used to hate playing against Wade Graham. If I was up against Wade Graham, I knew that I was going to get a missile come at me at some point in the game, and he wouldn't just do it to the halfbacks. Like, there's games where Wade Graham flies out the line and he changed momentum purely on his own where he'd come outside in, 
sit a big front row down, chase from marker. He'd do all the little one percenters. He's one of them players that done every oh sorry does everything right like does the one percenters right but can come up with them beautiful passes short balls long balls grubbers he's very unique in that sense and a bit like gifty on that edge where he where he could run those little plays with the center leads hit someone at the back but um i'm i'm really close to jack bird and he can't speak highly enough about him as not only a person but obviously a leader and a player so um, it's great to see him sign on for another year too. Obviously, mm. he had a bit of trouble with the head knocks and stuff. So hopefully he gets through unscathed and can continue playing at, at a lead level and being a great leader for the Sharks. That's probably something you can talk more on, but I think that just watching him develop as a leader yeah. over the last 10 years, like he, he, he's a big timer in the um, RLPA, isn't he? Like He's yeah. one of the main voices. Yeah, there's a couple of boys um, that have uh, like a big platform in the RLPA and try and do the right thing by the playing group, and he's certainly one of them. Even like just hearing him... The way he gets interviewed, there's certain people that you listen to talk to the media and get interviewed and you just tell that they've got their head screwed on and, and know exactly what they're talking about. They don't stutter, don't miss a word. And, you know, Wade's certainly one of them. So, as you said, to come through and play as a 17-year-old 5'8", um, to then go into the, the back row seamlessly and, and win a comp and then develop into the captain and the leader and someone that's been a staple of not only uh, the Shark side but the Origin team. And as you said, he's... If one of the best back rows of all time and Boyd Cordner wasn't in that left edge, Wade probably starts every single year. Mm. But he also adds that value of utility where if someone goes down that he's just invaluable to having your side. So um, as I said, I hated or hate playing against him because I know how tough and competitive and aggressive he is. But then also when you're defending him, you don't know if he's going to throw the short ball, the long ball, the grubber. He's just he's just the jack of all trades, a master of all of them too. And as I said, hopefully he gets through this year without any um, injuries and continue playing at a high level. The game needs him and, as you said, leaders like him and spokespeople. I think that's the best thing about Wade Graham. He could beat you in so many ways. So many, yeah. Like you, just, you can't prepare realistically. Like they, they had Andrew Fafita, obviously, in the Sharks' prime. They had James Maloney. They had Ben Barber. But they had all these threats across the field. Valentine Holmes, Jack Bird, mm-hmm. Cy Fecky. Ricky Latelli. But then they had these real tough, uncompromising characters that could play like... Matt Pryor was so tough, would fly out the line, but he could play. Luke Lewis, fly out the line, but could play. And then you had Wade Graham that could play with the ball as good as anyone, but would fly out the line with him. They just had these missiles come from everywhere. Like, you used to... Th- uh, Shark Park was the Bermuda Triangle in the sense that you'd go there, and oh, I've missed out the, the head honcho in, in Gal. Mm. They would just drag you into the street fight, and there's not many teams that made it out there with, with victories. I know that Melbourne used to go there at their peak and would struggle to win purely... With the players that the Sharks had and the way they played, they could play gritty, tough, grinding into the dirt, but they could also play that beautiful brand of football where they could put 40 on you and you'd go, what just happened? So um, I miss Gal out as the leader of that, but but Wade was sort of that group coming through and obviously now he's the older head, but fantastic player and obviously great role model for our game and yeah, someone that like people like myself look up to and aspire to be like. I always describe Shark Park. It's like a black hole for good football. It yeah. doesn't matter how well you're going, it doesn't fucking matter. You'll go there and just weird shit will happen to you. Do, you. do you get that vibe as a player as well when you go there? You're just like, fuck, it's going to be a tough... If Sharks could be undefeated or haven't won a game this year, it's going to be tough. I don't think I've ever won a game there like from uh, Harold Matz all the way through to first grade. It's just something... There's something different about going there and, and Sharks teams lift there. And you got to give a... you got to tip your cap to the crowd as well. The Sharks supporters are unbelievable. I, I love the thing they do with their fingers when the goal kicker yeah. kicks. And, um, it used Who was to be, the... Um, who was the goal kicker that that started for? That was Luke, Maloney, Luke, wasn't it? I think it was Luke Cavell. Oh, was Luke it? Luke Cavell, that was it. Yeah. He was so good spirit at kicking. Is that the left fi- left footer? Yeah, the one that kicked it like heaps higher. Yeah, yeah. yeah. With, spirit with the long fingers. skins. Oh, I don't know about the skins. I only, you, I only, you, I you're, you're the skins man. <laughs> <laughs> I might put them on this year, the long one. <laughs> but I noticed it a lot when Jim Maloney used to kick out, they'd get behind him and, mm. and, and do the fingers. And uh, Nico this year, when you'd wet his hair and slick it back and the crowd <laughs> the crowd behind when Sunday Arvo at Shark Park Leichhardt Oval is the best for a Sunday Arvo game bar none to play a game there but um, if you're a Sharks player I suppose you would say Shark Park they feel it every time and as I said it's such a hard place to go play let alone win and as you said Pete they just drag you to the mud and if you get out you've got to play a really really good tough brand of football and, and most teams go there and lose now, I won't ask you to guess how many Origins he's played, but another one that I am surprised with, only six Origin games. Really? Yeah, six Origin games. Yeah, that shocks me a little bit. I would have, oh, if you made me guess, I would have said 10 to 15. So easily. I would have said 15. Yeah. Easy. Wild. Uh, to his credit, he's won four of them. Of those six, he's only started in one of them. Yeah, see. 
when you have like Boyd, tough too. I mean, when you have the captain yeah, exactly. and, and one of the greatest back rows of all time there, it's hard. But um, I suppose it's a testament to how good our pack has been over the last sort of couple of years. We've produced mm. some unbelievable back rowers. And as you said, like every time he's played nearly, he's won. So it's a testament to him and how good he is as a player. 277 first grade games. So what does he need? 23 this year. Hopefully he stays injury free. Fingers crossed. Mm. He deserves 300 games. Absolutely. Like he's played the game, like just in its best form. Really tough, uncompromising, and, and and skillful. He's everything that you'd want to be as a player. I remember, I can't remember who I was listening to. I was listening to someone talk about how in Wade Graham's first year they were playing Penrith, and um, oh, fuck, it's going to annoy me all day. Who it was that said it? Said that that they, they got the ball. I look and take a hit up, and I thought oh, I'll I'll pick out this 17 year old kid, and he said absolutely got. Pole waxed by yeah. this weight, Graham. He was just an animal. How big is like, how big is he? Because like when you stand next to him, he's a big body. I know he's filled out obviously with age, but like he he's always been quite tall, hasn't he? So like he didn't just come in and he wasn't like a little high school mm. player. Like he he was pretty well developed from from memory anyway. The Sharks have him as one eighty six centimeter and ninety six kilos. Well, it's not it's not the big. How, how tall are you? I'm one eighty five, hundred kilos. But he's weight like. I feel like that's wrong because I, yeah. if I stood next oh, probably, to him, yeah. I reckon he'd be head and shoulders above me and built way bigger than me, mm. which isn't too hard. But uh, he's, a, he's a big body. And uh, I tell you what, if, if those are his stats, he hits way above his weight, which is mm. another testament to how he plays. Yeah, tremendous player. Anything else to add on White Oss? Nah, I just stoked he got uh, another contract this year. I think it's his like, 16th year or something in first grade, which is just Yeah, well, he started in, in 2008. Mm. That's cr- that's crazy when you think about. Because he doesn't it. seem that old. Like he, I don't know. I'm I'm glad he got another contract. But he's, he's also looked exactly the same. Yeah. From day one in 2008 to today. Yeah, exactly. Like he, he looks exactly the same. It's crazy. Mm. Want to kick us off with yours, mate? Yeah, I've gone for a um, a prop, uh, a, f- a fellow Englishman, so to speak. He's a lot more English than me, obviously, but uh, one of the all-time greats in my opinion. Uh, I feel like he changed the way front rowers play when he landed. Um, legend at St Helens um, He actually beat me in the grand final His last ever year So Which is extremely disappointing for myself But to see a guy like him Actually go out a winner you got to sit back and Be appreciative of the career he had Is um, James Graham mm. Like he When he come He started that chain passing With Aidan Tolman And Sam Cassiano And people like that Which would open up space for Josh Reynolds And Trent Hodgkinson To give the ball to Josh Morris And, and Benny Barber And people like that Um when you talk about uncompromising leaders that never took a backward step, um, I had the privilege of playing with Jammer for Great Britain. He was the captain of our side and to actually watch the way he prepared, to watch how passionate he was behind closed doors, the way he led, the way he didn't have any respect for his body and wasn't intimidate, intimidated by anyone, but also had the sleight of hand of, of a halfback. One of the all-time careers, doesn't get spoken about enough and um, got nothing but... Good words to say about him as a man, but certainly as a player, it was just incredible the way he come over from England and just transformed the way props played. Had had the balance between both. It's crazy when he came to Australia. And I don't think we probably appreciate this enough in the NRL. He played two hundred games in England before he got here. Yeah, he played one hundred and eighty in the NRL. Yeah, I can't remember how many grand finals has he played in because I don't have that. In front I think of he, you, I think he's played like in both countries. I think he's played in something like eight, mm. and I. I don't know if he'd won before. Yeah, he won his first and his last. Yeah, there you go. So, like, he was one from seven, I'm guessing, or something like that. And then he won against uh, the St. Helens beat Wigan in, in that grand final in 2020, the COVID year. And um, he gets a bit embarrassed by the way he celebrated at the end. But you, when you look back at it as an opposing play that lost the grand final, if there's anyone that was going to beat you and deserved it, it's someone like James Graham that left no stone unturned and got every little bit out of his body that he could give. So... He's um, someone that not only young props should look up to, young people that want to make it in the NRL or even Super League or any in anything, to know that you don't have to be the biggest, you don't have to look like a bodybuilder, you don't have to be the strongest or fastest, but you have to be the most resilient, tough, and work your backside off. And, and James Graham typifies that to, to the nth degree. Oh, I've never realised that he won a um, Man of Steel award yeah, that, four years before he came out here. Yeah, and that's how good he is. Like, do you think about... Uh, when Jason Tamalolo won the Dally M, how good of a season that had to be when mm. you consider that halves touch the ball the most. They, they have the fancy plays, the fullbacks and people like that. For a prop to, to win a, well, a Man of Steel, which is the Dally M equivalent in England, 
it's just a feat in itself and it just goes to show what an integral part he's been of every team he's ever played in. 53 test matches. Yeah, he just gave his you get a you get a special cap for when you play 50 tests for England and there's not been not been too many people that have done that and he actually I just saw a video mm. not long ago on Instagram he actually gave it back to his junior club and had tears in his eyes because he's so appreciative of where he started, where he's from and the people that helped him get to where he is today. So it just shows what a what a good man he is, let alone player. Um I know I've wrapped him a million here but actually getting to play with him and and watch how much not only he cares about his club side, but how much he cares about his country is something that like is, will stay with me for the rest of my life. And um, the amount of trust that every player has in him that I've ever spoken to that's played alongside him, they cannot speak highly enough of him and can drink a pint. Hmm. If you ever need to learn how to drink a pint of beer, Jam is your man. No doubt. Wasn't it, wasn't it fascinating, going back to the doggies, how they played in 14, 20, 12 and 14, like how they had people like Graham, Tolman, Cassiano, Greg Eastwood, oh, yeah, who, who would all be out, like all middles who could play with the ball. And then you got, like, if you're a defender, you've got, it goes middle, middle, half, edge, who can all do something with the ball. Like, that must have been crazy hard to defend. Well, we, we call it string plays, or a lot of clubs call it where, like, a middle will tip to a middle, will tip to another middle, or a middle will tip to a middle, and the third middle will lead for your half at the back, then your back row will lead for your full back. Every, every club obviously runs it, but um, have different plays for it. Like, the Roosters run it really well with Radley, where, uh, they'll line up with the three middles. They'll hit Crichton or Tupanua for a quick play of the ball. They'll go face ball across, let's say, Jared for uh, Takiaho to lead for Kiri. Then you have the other back row, depending on who laid the line, lead for Tedesco. And that's when you see Tedesco just run into open space and ISO three on twos. But James Graham as a prop had that real neat knack of having Ben Barber off his hip where he could play actually back on the inside or he'd play shorter and he had that show and go too. And for someone that isn't overly fast or big, he had to use all the deception in the world. And and as I said, like he changed the way that front rowers play. And you see a lot of props now that actually wave the ball around and use it to get one-on-one tackles and, and now getting those offloads. And I put a lot of that down to James Graham, who was, you know, to a lot of people was unknown when he was playing at St. Helens, winning comps and winning Man of Steels to come over here to be one of the greatest imports of all times. Um, his unreal story and he's doing well now in the podcast space and stuff too. So yeah, I was just about to say, uh, the buy round with James Graham, make sure you go and check out his podcast doing tremendous things there. Yeah, there's so, sorry. There's so many good ones. I listened to the Todd Greenberg one the other day. Do yourself a favor and listen to that it is so fascinating. Yeah. You know, my favorite thing. Uh, one of my favorite things that I've ever seen on James Graham's on Fox, uh, where he sits down with Matty Johns and he, and he talks about, um, the grand final kickoff with Sam when they when they mm. had the head clash. The way he did, I won't ruin it, and I don't want to do him an injustice by the, how passionately he speaks about it. But I, um, when we went on preseason camp, I actually got about ten of the the young lads to my room, and I actually made them sit down and and watch it. Not not only because it was Sam and James Graham, two of the best props in the comp, but the way he spoke emotionally about how much it meant to him to to go out there and set the tone for his team. And I don't know if they left with anything. Uh, from it but every time I watch it I get something out of it and every time he speaks I'm, I listen because I know that he just talks sense and um, I think he found another club I don't know if he went back to the Bulldogs or something like that I read that he's found another club because obviously uh, St George let him go but he needs to be involved in the NRL in some capacity because his mind and the way he speaks is just so so good yeah I'm pretty sure I read this morning he's going back to Canterbury isn't he have you seen anything I haven't about seen that but that is that's a no-brainer for me yeah I'm pretty Massive. sure he is was it just on that grand final wasn't it like it's like those two were just magnets yeah. they were only ever going to find each other yeah. off that kickoff unbelievable moment I think the other one that stands out for me was when you used to have those Good Friday clashes. Oh, the best. Mm. Yeah. They, it was the when Adam Reynolds got mm-hmm. charged down. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And he, was, <laughs> he had it behind his back, and it was just you, you just, like I, I'm the first one to say get out of ref's face, and whatever. You could just tell how his his determination just to win. Yeah, was unmatched. The the one thing that I'd encourage people to watch and um, people that don't watch the game as intently is probably what me, you, or or Maddie watch it is. Whenever a winger or a fullback or someone with electric speed would make a break and no one could catch him, James Graham would always chase until they put the ball down just in case. And he didn't do that to get a pat on the back. He did that because if something went wrong, like they dropped it or they tried to run it around for an easy conversion, he would bust his ass to get there to make it harder for the kicker to, like, to kick the goal or harder for the guy to score a try. Always in the picture. Like if someone made a break, I used to 
get a thrill out of watching James Graham bust his ass to get back and, and make it hard. And that's a, that's a good thing for any young kid to watch because I've seen um, in Holden Cup, Josh Starling run down someone from the Warriors as they, they were showboating and went to put the ball down mm. and he chased back and knocked it out of their hands. So you never know what's going to happen and um, you don't have to be the biggest or fastest, but you have to have a whole lot of heart to play in the NRL and he's the man. He, he exemplifies that for sure. Shout out to Josh Starling, by the way. I know that he, he watches champion fell yeah he's a good fella good good from the gong as well of course he is um <laughs> now i was just going to say too on james graham like you like you look through the history of rugby league and you sort of say oh you know this player was so good i wish he could have played origin because he was that good yeah i look at james graham and i just go he was he was tailor-made for origin yeah and he would have played for the blues obviously playing for the bulldogs in sydney it would have been obviously you would lose your sort of like roots of state of origin and what it means but it wouldn't have been it would have been great to see people like james graham and sam burgess and people like that that are obviously very proud englishmen but you know if they would have put on a blue or maroon jersey they would have represented it like they were from there and both their games were tailor-made to play origin that bash barge relentless uh pursuit to win so um he's one of my all-time favorite players especially as a prop the way he played was was phenomenal so i'm gonna ask you a question that's sort of like asking you to pick your favorite child Best English import, guy like him, Burgess, Ellery, there's been yeah, you know, well, Gareth the, Ellis is another one, some champions. It's very hard to, to pick one. Um, Ellery, Ellery's hard to go past. Mm. Uh, what he did for the Tigers or Balmain was was unbelievable. Gareth Ellis won player of the year for the for the Tigers three years in a row, I think, and had a beautiful combination with Benji. Like slide of hand from Benji and, and Gareth Ellis's lines that would he was built like a like a tank, like he was so hard to handle. And then you got the, probably the last two were the most famous that have come out. But like the, people forget about Gareth Widdop. Mm. Like what Gaz did coming over at a young age, playing for Melbourne, partnering Cooper Cronk to a grand final, then ultimately going to the Dragons, leaving his comfort zone to captain them. Um, scored a bucket load of points every year, skillful, smart. Again, wasn't the quickest, but Gaz, I got to play with him for Great Britain. We weren't as success, successful as we liked, but I learned a lot of, he was very good at like letting it go. Like he'd he'd go to train and train really well, but being able to park it for for tomorrow or park it for video. Whereas I was very so much like, oh, what about this? What about this? And he just helped me sort of just relax and and just focus on the next thing. So um, if I had to pick one, um, just purely on favourite to watch would probably be Sam. Mm. Um, what he did for the Rabbitohs and the way he played and the courage he played with and every single week you know he was going to smash someone or he was going to get smashed for the better good of his team. Um, it's hard to argue, but um, Ellery and, and Gareth and, and Jammer and all those boys, it's hard to it's hard to pick one. It was unreal that you had, obviously, Sam Burgess and James Graham playing at the same time, South Sydney and Canterbury, two arch rivals. I always think to myself, how good would it have been if we could have taken a prime Adrian Morley, oh, chucked him in the Miles, Roosters yeah. at the same time, and then you would have had... Like the Roosters hate Canterbury, Canterbury hate the Roosters, Roosters hate... They all hate each other. And if you could have had these three alphas, these pommy alphas playing for each team, going at each other, it would have been fucking unbelievable. I think those three played together for Great Britain. Um, maybe in Sam's first couple of tests, Sam played real early on. And I know that um, he obviously played with Jammer a hell of a lot of times. And those two were lethal together with blokes like Jamie Peacock and stuff like that. But I'm sure that, I'm sure that they all played together at one point. Moz was obviously at the back end. But could you imagine if you if you didn't know who those three were and they were just playing in the Super League and, and you were playing against them and you come up against those three? Let me let me read you out uh, Great Britain's Ford Pack in Sam Burgess' first game. Yeah, go, go on. Front rows were Adrian Morley and Sam Burgess. Your back row is Jamie Peacock, Gareth Ellis, Sean O'Loughlin. And then James Graham's on the bench somewhere. Wow. England's – this is one thing I'll, I, I like – I feel like I need to say. When you go over and play in the Super League, the depth – of talent is obviously nowhere near the NRL and that's not a disrespect to Super League I love it more than than anyone for what it did to me like I'll defend Super League to the cows come home the depth isn't as good what I will say is no matter what team you play in the English front rowers are tough as fuck mate it's scary how tough some of them are they don't care who you are they don't care what you've done they play to just go like that for 80 minutes and that forward pack I'd argue would be as good as any forward pack on its day and most feared like Not that shit. pack, if they're all at their fearsome best, <laughs> who was the hooker? James Roby? Um, Terry, Terry Newton. Oh, 
of rest in love to Terry Newton, passed away not not so long ago. He he was a hooker for Wigan, and he was just tough as nails as well. So I mean, from hooker to to back row to lock to prop to the interchange, that pack is a joke how tough it was. And um, yeah, English forward packs, mate. You can see how well they're going at the World Cup now. Tom Burgess leading the charge and and leading the boys. And oh, how good was Tommy Burgess on the weekend? Oh, he has been. I, I feel like he's been the standout prop of the World Cup. I don't know about you guys, but. It, d- it doesn't matter who he's played because you can only play what's in front of you. I feel like every week he's been up there for man of the match for England. I sort of feel like him as well. And Matty, you can talk more about it. But like for South Sydney over the last year, he's been tremendous every time mm. he's played. But every time he hasn't played, Totola's really stepped up and yeah. it probably hasn't left the gap that it should have because Tom Burgess was incredible this season. Tom, yeah, Tom was Tom was so good. He's been good the last couple of years. Like it's it's kind of interesting how he he kind of kicked on a little bit later mm. but i think when because george obviously was just so unbelievable from like 2014 to a bit and then i think they kind of got l- looped in with each other like george's best and george's worst was a lot higher and lower than tom's best and worse and then but tom's worst was getting looped in with george's worst a bit i, I feel tom wasn't like he didn't have like everyone's like oh tom burgess had so many errors at the start of his career i don't think he actually did i just think he was kind of just in George Burgess' shadow for a bit, and now in the last few years, he's emerged. Yeah, try to tackle him, though. Yeah, yeah, he might drop it once every now and then, but try to fucking tackle him. It's mm. almost impossible. And speaking of George, like, obviously, uh, he struggled with his hip. He had one of the worst hip injuries you yeah, could have. Shocker. And first, first rugby league player to come back from literally like a hip replacement. So, like, it's a testament to him. But what about his try in that, in that grand final? Oh. Was it from 30 out? And he looked like a... 100 metre runner Like it was unbelievable Strength, power, athleticism And I was lucky enough To play with George Obviously he wasn't at his best Due to a degenerative hip But um, mm. To say I've played I've played with all the Burgess boys Besides Sam He um, His shoulder got so bad He couldn't play on the Great Britain Tour Ended up retiring um, I would have loved that moment But There's been so many good English players That have come out And I know we're getting off topic But Herbie Farmworth If he keeps His, his track going He could be one of the best English Englishmen to come out And and do what he's doing as well. He's been outstanding not only for the Broncos but for England in this World Cup as well. Just on George, he did that a few times that year. Like we just grabbed the ball and just run through. Did it on Good Friday. Did it in round one. Did in the grand. I'll read you his grand final stats. Again, I know we're off topic, but it's fine. <laughs> uh, a try, two hundred and thirteen meters, a line break, and twenty nine tackles with only one missed. And That's he went off with a HIA at one point. <laughs> That's outstanding. Like he could have got the Clive if Sam didn't. Do what Sam did. Crazy. I can confirm too. About two days later, I was up at uh, Randwick Shops getting myself a coffee. And I heard this noise back of the cafe, and I thought, what "The fuck is that?" I turned around. There's the corpse of George Burgess. They <laughs> <laughs> just let him have a little nap, and then the bus pulled up for your what, your, your lap around the city or whatever. Yeah. And Sam pops head. He goes, "George!" And he goes, oh, fuck, and he off, and I was just sitting there going, "Okay, <laughs> beautiful." Yeah. Uh, I was about to say George Burgess. Uh, James Graham, cracking shout there. Who's yeah. your next one? I've gone um, someone that made the game look so easy. And like we spoke about last time I was on pure form of footy, I've gone with uh, Fletty Matea. Like you think about some of the guys that Fletty played with, obviously Hayne, Chris Ninu, these naturally gifted guys. Some of the stuff that he did, post-line, pre-line, footwork, offload, long ball, grubber, chip kick, could play six easily. Like, I know he played a lot of games at six. But my favourite thing with Fletty Mateo was when he played at the Warriors and James Maloney used to come off those real arcing runs and he'd bounce across field, skip across, and then Maloney would punch that hole outside C or D defender. And you'd never expect it because not many halves did it. I know Mitchell Pearce, I spoke about him last time, but he was courageous at hitting those courage lines, but not too many halves did it, especially at Jimmy Maloney's weight but to have a ball like a ball player through the middle like Fletty or on an edge that actually had the sleight of hand to hold it if it wasn't on or to actually tip on when Jimmy hit outside B or C defender the amount of times if you go watch probably Maloney's highlight reel that Fletty's passing the ball or offloading the ball he was a huge part while the Warriors uh, went to the grand final and even with Para that year that Hayne went on the run Fletty was a massive part of that so um, I feel like he doesn't probably get the respect of, of what he deserves, as, especially as a ball-playing middle. He was outstanding. Matty, can, can you have a look? I'm just have a look. It says that he made his debut in 2004. He played one game. Then he didn't play for Parramatta again until 2007. Did, yeah. did he go to the Super League? Or no. Did he... no, no, no. Oh, yes, he did. Sorry. He played for London in 2005. Yeah, right. 
Is that right? Yes, he played 14 games. There you go. See, I did. It's interesting. I didn't know that. Yeah, I right. didn't know that either. Uh, I, I always remember in that 07, 08, you know, when Hayne first burst on the scene, Inu was at his dangerous best, and then you had Fleddy Mateo, and they used to wear that yellow, and it had the little blue stripes on the yep. side. Um, I can't. Well, well, Pertec wasn't it? Pertec or red. It was something red down yeah. the middle. Yeah, and the fucking when he used to hold that ball with one hand, he was an absolute freak, Fleddy Mateo. What was his best position? I don't know. I, th- I think he spent most of his time on an edge, didn't he? Where yep. he got where he got early ball, and he could. It was a bit like Glenn Stewart, where he could play play with the ball a, a lot and and have centers. Um, you know, run lines of him, but I, I used to love watching when he get crossed by the the say the right side half, and he'd mm-hmm. bounce right across, and he'd have middles coming under, coming under, and then Maloney would just hit that hard arcing run outside, like the the far back rower, and he was. So, I'd never seen James Maloney get a hospital pass off Fletty Mateo. It was either it was on, or Fletty would probably show and go, go down, and get a quick play of the ball. But um, I've seen him win games at five eight for for all the teams he's played for too. He's just an immense talent, and uh, he's working. Um, with our um, New South Wales Cup team and, and stuff like that now too. So he's not lost to the game, which is good because people of the immense talent that Fletty had need, need to be involved in the game in some capacity. But um, I played him one day at Brookvale Oval. It was him, Steve Maddai, George Defua and uh, Kieran Foran. And we we got the chocolates that day. I started a half back up against Kieran Foran. He's one of my favourite players. But he made my night a living hell, Fletty Mateo, especially with the footy. Like just so hard to... To handle had that had this weird way of like being able to dip his shoulder and like get in behind you and you'd be reaching for him. Then he had the offload around the back, had the dummy, held the ball like that. Just freak of a player, man. Yeah, I was just have a look through his career. Thirty one games at five eight, seventy two in the back row, forty five at lock, and then came off the bench on eighty two occasions. He's just a tremendous player, wasn't he? He could just do it all. Like when he used to come off the bench, I think like that was a good tactic because yeah. like imagine you're a, you're a tired middle playing a long stint and you get someone with the footwork size and ability to offload and play like your eyes would be going everywhere like because then you didn't just have him obviously and we'll talk about the parasite more but you'd have like Hain out there and you'd have Inu out there and it'd just be who do you who do you go to especially if they're all split up if you had Hain at one Inu on the left and Mateo on the right you've got a threat literally on every mm. part of the park and. If he played with Tim Smith, he probably would have scored about 50 tries. Did he play with Tim Smith? He would have, wouldn't he? Yeah. Uh, actually, no. That, 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 oh, he might have been 07, but that, that, that year that Tim Smith absolutely brained it, what was that, 05? Yeah, is 2005. Is 2005. That the, he got the record for most tries this that year, didn't yeah, he? Yeah, that was, yeah. Everything yeah. he touched was First it. year. What oh, a joke. Oh, oh, I had him on the year, podcast too. Unbelievable. Like he just he, he hardly even wants to talk about it. It's like trying to get blood out of a stone. It's yeah. A crazy season. But like... You could just imagine him playing with people like that. I know, like he he played a lot off Daniel Mortimer, and remember yeah. when Daniel Mortimer burst on the scene, how courageous he was. Like talk about going deep into the line for a little bloke. Mortz went right into the line, and he did play with Timmy Smith. Yeah, seven. Yeah, yeah. Well, I'll, I might actually go back and watch that that highlight reel because those two together would have been something special. Timmy Smith was the was a gunslinger, and then you had the the amazing athlete and, and freak in Fletty. So he's someone that doesn't get spoke about enough, I don't think, and he had a f- fantastic career too. That Paramount Eels side, they went uh, all the way to a prelim final in 07, beaten by Melbourne, cheating Melbourne. Yeah, they, they had some good years there, Parra, didn't they? Like the year that, what, what year did they make the, the Grandy? That was 2009. That's, that's Hange year where yeah, it was, was yeah, the big unbelievable, Hange. eh? Yeah. And they, they played Melbourne in that grand final, didn't they? Yeah. Yep. Yeah, yep. it's weird how it all works, isn't yeah. it? Yeah, so often that sort of shit happens yeah. in rugby league. It's crazy. But he also played in that grand final with the Warriors, did he not? Yep. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so I mean, he's a winner too. Like, that's Absolutely. that's one thing about Fletty. He went to places and won. So um, that that probably gets lost a little bit. But yeah, absolute freak. I f- like, when I was thinking about ball playing middles and, and we spoke about it, and I went home and um, I actually like, fought a Fletty late and, and watched his highlight reel. It's a, it's crazy to watch, man. It's, it's pretty like he's special. just taking the piss sometimes. It's like he's like, just playing in the backyard, yeah. just just trying stuff that you wouldn't necessarily try in an NRL game. But he didn't just try to come off, which is quite unique and special. Like there's a lot of people like oh, I can talk about myself a little bit where you you try something at training and you think, oh, do I want to do it in the game? And 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 you see it unfold in the game, but you don't actually have the courage to do it because you're worried about handing the ball over. Where he'd just blow caution to the wind, and nine times out of ten, it'd actually come off, which is unique because you don't get too many blokes that are one confident enough to do it and, and two back themselves and and then three for it to actually come off and, and be an actual big play for your team so 
yeah, fantastic player, fantastic career, and from all reports, fantastic person as well. That's what I also loved about him, and I could understand at times it could be frustrating, but he could make the same mistake nine times, not be afraid to do it the tenth time yeah. in yeah. trying to win. Yeah, and that's what special players do. That's yeah. what that Parramatta team was. You know, they had people like Hayne that could score off his own try line, Inu could catch a ball one hand blindfolded, and then Folletti could create a piece of play that no one in the world could too. So, I mean, he um, – phenomenal talent and, and so on that I used to love watching. I used to love watching Parramatta play as a whole, and, and he was a huge reason why I used to love watching him play. Any moments to stand out for you or anything, Matty? Bloody. I mean, not, not nothing that you haven't said before. Like, as you said, he was just a part of that Para 09 Warriors uh, 2011 team. Yeah, he, he, he was – when I was coming through school, he was definitely one of my favourite players. He was just an absolute joy to watch, just how he could just pop an offload out of anywhere. And, yeah, fantastic player. He's one of those guys that you would – that like, if I looked back on his career and he played – 100 games I wouldn't have been shocked mm. just because he was you know he, he could have your up and down games and we know what rugby league media is like mm. you remember all the downs yeah. you enjoy the highs but you remember mm. the downs yeah. um 200 first grade games it's a big effort it's a big effort for anyone but like you 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 gotta respect anyone that plays in the middle of the field you know what I mean yep. you, the boy every single player we've spoken about now has played over 250 games I think or at least 200 and they all played the game tough too so to play one NRL game special, to play 50 is a, a cool accomplishment, but to play 200 in the middle, you've got to tip your cap to anyone that does that. 100%. All right. I'll take my two away. Go on, who you got? All right. My first one is a little bit old school. Uh, Gavin Miller. So Gavin Miller, uh, remember a couple of years ago when Jason Tamalolo won the Dalian medal? We all went, holy fuck, he's a forward. Unbelievable. Gavin Miller won it. Back-to-back years, 88 and 89 as a back rower. Unbelievable stuff. I just, like, he started his career in 1977. He was playing for West East Sharks from 77 to 84. And, you know, as I said to you last week, um, I had Bernie Gurr on the podcast. He was actually in this East team with him. He sort of said he was a good player, solid. Not, not much more to it. Similar to yourself, he went over to the Super League. And he absolutely fucking killed it over there. I think it's for Hull that he was playing for. He got named in their team of the century or yeah. something the other day. He was there locked forward. Uh, did really well over there. Came back to the to the NRL and absolutely dominated it. Just yeah. killed it. One back to back, um, back to back Dalia medals. He also won a Man of Steel over there in England. So he's I think he's one of. Oh, there's not many. I remember when Benny Barber won. He was the last one to win. I think Dalian it's just them, those Steel. two. Yeah. I think it's just those two. Yeah, off the top of my head it would be, yeah. Unless you got your eyes on it. <laughs> oh well, I'd love to I'd love to join the I'd love to join the group. Nico told me it's a nice little pay packet too, so <laughs> <laughs> I'd love that. Yeah. But um yeah, incredible. Like he when you have a look at in nineteen eighty eight and nineteen eighty nine, he he had a man of the match in a World Cup grand final. They they had a they had a rugby league world cup that went from nineteen eighty five to nineteen eighty eight. It was played over X amount of years and all that, but he got man of the match in that. Uh, he won two Daly M's. He had a man of steel, rugby league week player of the year, and a Rothmans medal. He did that all in four years. Well, that, that's two Daly. Ah, uh, that's three Daly M's, really, isn't it? Like because the Rothmans was the Daly M before yep. the Daly M. I I obviously didn't get to witness him play. I wasn't alive. But when I went to Super League, he was spoken about in glowing terms. And mm-hmm. when obviously when you walk through Hull and you hear about some of the the great sort of imports and and not only imports but players that played for their club. He's certainly someone that gets mentioned in, in, in glowing terms too. You know, like they talk about him, they talk about Sturlow and people like that that went over and didn't just help their club on the field, they helped it off it to attract like immense talent such as yourself. But yeah, to, to win one Daly M special, to win three essentially, and then to go over to the other side of the world when you weren't really playing, as Bernie Gurr said, the most like, outstanding football. And he to- also left the NRL originally as a centre. Well, there you go. It's a bit like a lot of the boys, they can interchange positions that we spoke about and, and it takes a fair player to be able to adapt to that. Not only adapt to it, but absolutely brain it as well. And um, yeah, someone someone special and, and to win all those individual accolades just shows what a career he had. And I mentioned before, he, he got man of the match in the World Cup final of 88. He also, remember how they used to do those... Um, Rest of the world versus the kangaroos. Ah, yep. They have yep. one of those games. They used to assemble. You know, used to have the kangaroos. Then they'd assemble a best seventeen from the rest of the world. He got man of the match in that as well. So the big games he stood up essentially. Yeah. Which which separates a lot of players. Like when you look at people, like, like the World Cup's an easy one to to look at, but 
uh, that's just take New Zealand, for example. When the games have been on the line for New Zealand, Joey Manu mm. has risen above, head and shoulders above everyone else, and that's why he's a superstar. When the game's on the line for the for the Roosters, obviously I could say Joey Manu, but nine times out of ten, Tedesco will come up with a, with a special play. You know what I mean? Like the the players that we call elite or great always play well in the big, like Munster in Origin. It's a given that he's going to get man of the match at some point or player of the series. Cam Smith did it every every big game. He was going to get man of the match. You know so. He's another one where you look at the biggest games against the best players and the best teams, and, and he'd be head and shoulders above the rest of them, which which separates him as a player. I think quite often when we think ball playing, you know, we think of the you know the long passes, the cutouts, the flick balls. I, I, I'll attach his highlight. There's a highlights package on, on on YouTube of this guy Gavin Miller, and when you watch it, you just I found myself every single try set up. I paused it. I went back, and mate, it's all just about where he places his hips. Yep. where he takes his steps, the angles he leans at, and just the way that he was just drawing in defenders. It's about a 15-minute highlight package. I don't reckon he ever throws a pass more than a metre. Yeah. And it's the most entertaining fucking thing I've ever seen. Yeah, I'll, 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 I'll certainly watch it, obviously. But the art of ball playing gets lost a little bit because we've had so many flashy players that can do all these brilliant things and pass the ball these long distances. As you said, there's little little details, little subtle tells in, in opposition players that... He probably didn't have the access to video that we get now, but on the run, when certain people get fatigued in them, they move certain ways. And if you're well connected with your front rolls, back rolls, your your fullback and your halves, there's little plays that you don't even have to talk about. You just look, I need you here, push up. Yeah. It's either short out the back or opens up your show and go too. So to be able to do that in an era where I guess video wasn't such a big thing and he obviously had all the little details down pat, um, yeah, unique, special and, and gifted there's moments throughout it where you can see him like prop off his right to go to the inside shoulder and create a little hole and he has to wait for his teammates to realise he's created that because yeah. it's just it looks so natural it looks like there's nothing on yeah. and there's times where he knows they're a little bit late so he has to sort of float in the air and wait for them to get there at top speed Just and this is this is in the 80s yeah. like, that's the other thing if you watch how you know we, we, we talk about it with halves now watch how deep this guy goes into the line yeah. on every single play. Fucking incredible. Had a little um, kicking game as well. Oh, and there you go. Like, you know, obviously the footballs that we play with now, yeah. they're designed to kick. Yeah. These were wet bricks. He would have been wearing those steel cap boots and everything, yep. wouldn't he? So yep. hard to move around in, hard to do anything in really. It's like, it's going to lay bricks. That, that, that it's crazy. Heavy. Yeah. yeah. Uh, incredible career by... Gavin Miller, I think he is criminally underrated. I know that um, Matt Johns is just about the only one that brings him up. Matty Johns talks about him and what he achieved and everything, but I think he's a guy we need to be much more aware of. Now, my second ball playing forward that I've got uh, was one of my favourites growing up. I absolutely love to watch this guy play. Uh, the great Greg Bird. Now, played for the Sharks, then moved up to the Gold Coast Titans, spent a lot of time on the sidelines, obviously, could find himself in trouble. Was it Paul Martini that he almost put, put his knee through his head that time? Uh, I think it was Shane Martini. Shane Martini, yeah. that's it. Yeah. yeah. One of the, I was at that game. One of the great yeah. brain, brain explosions of all time. Uh, Birdie, no stranger to a brain explosion on the field, obviously. But fuck, he was talented. I've got, I've got a little stat for you, right? So, in State of Origin, he obviously played for New South Wales during that period where we just couldn't win fucking anything. We're going up against this unbelievable team. We never really stood a chance. Uh, Birdie played the vast majority of his origin career at Locker in the back row. There was a couple of times where they picked him at 5'8", right? So just to take you through some of the other great origin players. So, Wally Lewis. He played 31 games of State of Origin. All of them at 5'8". He won man of the match on eight occasions. Thurston played 37 games. He got man of the match on five occasions. Joey... 23 games, man of the match on four occasions. Darren Lockyer, 36 games. He won it on three occasions, man of the match. Bird was picked at 5'8", three times for New South Wales. He got man of the match twice. Two man of the matches from three games in that side. And if you want to count it, he got man of the match in game three of 2007 and then game one, 2008. So two games in a row at 5'8", Greg Bird was man of the match against that Queensland team. Yeah, like Queensland used to go with like Petro and, and Webke and Carl Orr and um, Carl Webb and all these big brutes up front. And we used to go with, like as I was just talking about before, like Greg Bird, Paul Gallen, Luke Lewis, like blokes like Boyd Cordner when they were coming through small, like smaller, sorry, 
agile leg speed. And I remember like all my favorite origin moments I can remember watching and I was old enough to obviously take it all in was when Greg Bird and Paul Gallen used to play together through the middle, like no backward step. Obviously there was a few brain explosions along the way, but those two were the two that really stood up to Queensland for us every single time we played. And I used to love when he used to come back against the grain, his footwork, never say die attitude and, and would just fight like fuck for everything, man. Like I, um, I played against him at the back end of his career over in the Super League for Catalan and he was actually playing five eight opposite me, and I remember my first touch of the ball. He flew out and whacked me without it, and I was shitting myself like <laughs> the whole game because it, it, he did take it like personal. It was like obviously come out to unsettle me, and we got the chocolates by a fair margin. But every time I got the ball, I could see Greg Bird out the corner of my eyes, and I just couldn't imagine him in his prime. What he'd do to some ball playing middles or halves when they went into the line, and he was in front of him because you didn't even have to worry about Gallon. You had to worry about Bird as well. So. Mm. Phenomenal player, tough as anyone that's ever played the game. And just I just used to love watching him play because as you said, like he had the great balance between doing all that stuff where he'd he'd push the he'd push the line, push the line, chance of getting sent to the sim bin. But then he'd set up three tries for you or score one himself with pure skill. So fantastic player and someone that um was one of my favourites, especially origin time. Would, would I be right to say that for, as a New South Wales fan, no matter what you thought of Greg Bird Around origin time, he was everyone's favourite player. Everyone from New South Wales fucking adored him. Had to get picked first. Like him and Gallen yep. had to get picked first. And Luke Lewis had to get picked. Like people that Glenn Stewart, well, I know he didn't get picked as often, but had to get picked yep. because they didn't take a backward step. And like they were willing, like Gal was willing to call call Queenslanders out and go up there and, and lead from the front and, and, and not give a shit. And, and Bird, Birdie would follow him. They called him the Bash Brothers at Cronulla, didn't they? Because yeah, they were just. Brothers. They just do anything to win and I couldn't imagine actually playing against both of them in their primes when they were just flying around smashing everyone like it's crazy man just on that you know as you said made for state of origin like when you consider there's only two guys two New South Wales players ever that have got more men in the match awards in origin than Greg Bird it's Sterling and Joey and they got one more man in the match more than him and Joey would have played 10 more games than him it's pretty impressive and especially he was like he was obviously played a lot at five eight for his career, but he was an out and out back row lock, wasn't he? You know, so it's a pretty special achievement, really, like to be able to do that. Yeah, and he obviously, like he was at the Sharkies, went to the Gold Coast Titans, and sort of left the Sharks before you know they obviously won the comp or anything. They had they had a reasonably successful team. It's interesting. His he made his debut in two thousand and two. Came off the bench for about ten games or so. His run on debut was at 5-8 in the prelim final against the Warriors. I'm not sure if you remember that game, but the Warriors essentially brought every ticket in the stadium and just handed it out to their fans. So it was... It was do you remember that? Do you, do you I have remember no that? memory of this whatsoever. 2002, yeah. So remember the, the Warriors played the Roosters in the grand final? Was that the game that um, David Peachy caught the kickoff and kicked it back? Is that that game? Can you remember that? Potentially. That, I, that was, remember I don't that. know who it was against. It was a semi-final, but yeah. But there was There was that... That game, the week before, the Sharks gave it to the Dragons. They beat them by like 30 points. The 5-8 was Matt Johns. Right. He got injured. It's the last game he ever played. And Greg Bird made his run on debut at 5-8 wow. in a prelim final against that Warriors team. And they only got beat by four or something. It was a really close match. And there's there's some... I, yeah, I'm, I'm worried now that I might have it wrong. But there's some story that like the Warriors CEO brought thousands upon thousands of tickets and then just handed them. To, uh, to Warriors fans to go. That's unreal. And he he's made for that arena, like that uncompromising arena where it's uncomfortable for most other people, but he's that mentally resilient that it just wouldn't have worried about him. The one thing I remember about Greg Bird was that um, unique running style, like low to the ground, yeah. hips would move. Like he, you could just tell why he was so hard to tackle and he had strength that, that it looked like he didn't have, you know what I mean? He, he's small and compact, but... Could uh, could bang with the best of him. He was um, outstanding to watch play. Terrible to play against. You always worried about your ribs when you played against him. But I used to love watching him play. And he, him and Gal were were the two at Cronulla that started that. As we spoke about that place where you'd go to Shark Park and you know you were going to get bashed for eighty minutes. And um, I suppose he's iconic around those parts and someone that did it all in the game, New South Wales, Australia, and someone that I've got the utmost respect for as well. Now. I think we that's covered all of our each of our two guys we selected. Some of the next best that potentially didn't make it in, and there's a few that are in the the modern day game, which we'll get to in a sec. But Artie Beatson was one we didn't talk about, obviously, oh, yeah, and a model of our game. Um, 
the offload fucking king. And we don't have enough tape of Artie to probably appreciate it as much as we can, but fuck, he could play. It's it's Beetson and Laotiti, the two offload kings, you yep. know. Um, th- those two were probably head and shoulders. And then Sonny, like you got to chuck Sonny. Those three are probably the three most well-known for post-line offloads. There's a lot of people that can stand in tackles and palm and, and, and tip it out the back, but those three would run to bust, have the arm forward and just have inside, outside and... The one thing about those three guys is they could do it with both hands. Mm. Like it's easy for someone with their dominant hand with a sweaty rugby league ball in contact to go through the line and to pop it. But to be able to do it left or right or go above people or around people with with either hand is pretty special. And those three were some of the greatest athletes but most unique talents we've ever seen play really. Well, when you're talking about those three and you're talking offloading, like I probably don't see that as offloading like other players. That's them ball playing. Yeah, that's exactly. them playing through the line. Yeah. Essentially, they just take bodies, but they know exactly what they're doing. Yeah, the well, entire that, time. and that and that I well I I don't know this for a fact, obviously, because I, I wasn't in their mind. But they always look like from what I've seen of Artie play, which it wasn't much. I've seen tapes of him play. Obviously, saw Sonny train and play a little bit. Their mentality, from what it seemed, was always to bust the line first. Mm. You probably see uh, at times people want to offload before they've actually dented the line. Whereas these three would just be physical and just dent the line, and if they were people were dragging off their back or or trying to get them down through the legs and their arm was free, it was just offload to to five eights and fullbacks pushing for the line. And the the special thing about them guys was they didn't just do it once or twice a year; they done it every single week consistently for their whole careers, and that's what separates them from the other people that that played in the middle of the park. You know what I mean? They had the gift of the offload and. It's probably a bit of a lost start these days mm-hmm. because it, we're so high on completion rates and getting to our kicks. But those three did it at such a high clip that you wouldn't even have to worry about if they were going to drop it or not because they just didn't. little story on Artie. I remember when, when I was a kid and, you know, when, when, when he was alive still, used to go down to the stadium and he'd be in the squash courts all the time. <laughs> yeah. Have you ever heard these stories? Oh, like, my, dad, my dad has told me brief stories about Artie, but none of these ones. Oh, are. mate. Like, just like he, he must have been 120, 130 kilos, right? Standing in the middle of the squash court versing guys that look fit as a fiddle. And if he served, he knew exactly where he'd put you. He knew exactly how you'd have to hit it back because you'd have no other choice. And then he would just be able to dominate the point from there. And you could tell he, he was just fucking around with blokes, just letting them run all around the place. And when he wanted wanted to finish them, he would. And well, it was done. So and he, he, he never moved. That's so what he done on a footy field as yeah, well. exactly right. It was right, like moving yeah. chess pieces, wasn't it, for him? And that's why he's an iconic figure of our game and, and someone that, you know, we wish was still around to, to pick his brain and and to get his understanding of football because he was uh, obviously once in a generation player, once in a lifetime player and and person and, and role model for our game and obviously was a big part of starting State of Origin and things like that. So as a player that plays the game now and gets to you know follow in his footsteps of what he created, you can't be more thankful for someone like him. Another name that you mentioned there, Ali Lawatiti. Once described as the Michael Jordan of rugby league, he was. Uh, I I'm I'm so happy for Super League that you had him and everything, but fuck, I still think to this day it is the biggest mistake in New Zealand Warriors history. Yeah, if you talk to people that played with him and played against him over in Super League, they like the word impossible gets thrown around a bit too much because nothing's obviously impossible, but. The closest thing to that was stopping his offload. Mm. And here's a reason why his teams over in the Super League were so successful and, and won so many competitions and Challenge Cups and things like that because he could just... And you got to think about it. He was playing for wet rhino football. He wasn't playing for Steeden. He was playing for ball with bugger all grip on it and in the torrential rain playing the game at the start of the year in winter, eventually going into summer. But to be able to do that in the wet months in England and do it consistently and as I said do, and win game for your team to be able to hold the ball in one hand and offload in traffic it takes a unique talent and a special talent so yeah I'm so glad that I didn't have to mark him or try and tackle him because it, as I said it was spoken about as near impossible I still, I still like I remember being so young but just the news that he was leaving and it was just the most surreal. why did he go why did he go over there well because the story goes something along the lines of the Warriors they they lost in the 02 grand final I think they came back in 03 and they didn't do too well or 04 they didn't do too well and I think the owner essentially it was something along the lines of that he said that his his faith was hot higher than football and they sort of went well nothing nothing can mean more to you than rugby league that's not good enough that's not the standard we're going to set and then they let him go and he, he never came back we never saw him again I, I just yeah obviously I, I wasn't old enough to, to know about any of that but 
all I know is that like he's spoken about in such glowing terms in England, like one of the the greatest players to to go over there and play and and had a fantastic career and won a lot of trophies and um, he's still spoken about for the offload. So I mean, if you play the game and you're spoken about for for one part of the game that you were the best at, um, you obviously did something right. So. Hell of a player, hell of a career as well. I think did, did he come back and play for the Warriors adventure? I think he came. Yeah, back he did. He did very late. But I don't yeah. think I don't know if he actually. I think he played reserve. He grade. Played reserve grade. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, that's yeah. a shame. Fuck, he was a player. I, I think it might have been twenty sixteen. That's my guess. Yeah, I, I haven't had there. a look if there's a full highlights package of him, but like if you can find anything, the the, the Warriors did a um, they did a documentary. I think it was called. We were Warriors or something. Have either, either of you seen this? I haven't seen chance? it. No. Oh, and it's about like how the Warriors started, and then when he came along, and that mate, there's, uh, it's it's like a six chapter series, and there is honestly a fucking chapter on why we shouldn't have let him go and why it just turned the franchise. What's that on? Oh, on its head. I want to say that, KO, but I, it might. It, when did the Warriors come in? Not, uh, I, I, I think it was like a, a, a 20 year or 25 year s- celebration thing. I'll find it for you. Yeah, cool. I want to watch that for sure. Uh, yeah. Very entertaining. Um, the other one I had on my list that I didn't get to mention, he's one of my favourite players of all time, Jimmy Dimmick. Yeah. Fuck, tough as nails and yeah. so skillful. Won the uh, won the Clive Churchill in 95 for Canterbury. Uh, that team came from fifth to win the comp that year. I think he is so underrated. It's not funny, Jimmy Dimmick. Yeah, another one uh, I didn't really get the privilege of watching play, but when you see him coach teams and you hear his stories of him as a player, I was actually talking to my mum about um, people that she thought should be on the list this morning and she said Jim Dimmick first straight off the bat. So, I mean, I'm not saying she knows everything, but if, you know, your mother is pointing out players that, you know, are deserving to be on the greatest ever ball playing forwards list, he's obviously done something right. And um, I know people that have played against him and, and heard stories about him and he must have been one hell of a player and, the one thing that always stands out was obviously his ball playing, but just tough as teak. Yeah. That's what gets spoken about all the time, how tough he was, never took a backward step, confrontational and, and played well above his weight too. So um, he's doing great things in the coaching space now, been around for a while coaching and um, it's great to see people like him that aren't lost to the game, they're still involved and, and coaching the next generation. I was talking to, I'm not sure who it was, I was, I was talking to someone from that 95 Bulldogs team that came on the podcast and they were saying that, thank God they weren't doing like wrestling sessions back then because he reckons that Jimmy was like granite like he was always a big boy We're still built solid now isn't he yeah, yeah like but he, he said that like in defense his technique was just perfect and if they would have been doing any wrestling then it would have been a non-contest yeah I could imagine the the blokes that are small to the ground and compact and uh when you get into those knee wrestle battles in the wrestling room it's you may as well lay on your back because you're not yep. getting up so um, I wouldn't have liked to have played against him for everything I heard, but phenomenal player for sure. The other one I want to throw in there, and he's probably not regarded as you know a, a ball playing forward, but I always thought he was so skillful. Andrew Ryan. Oh, Canary Bob Bulldogs. Cut, yeah. Mate, you go back, you watch that 2004 grand final, there's a pass that he throws to Matt Utah. Yeah. Cut out ball that was just fucking perfect. And once again, he's not the sort of guy that we talk about as a ball player. Uh, he probably wasn't as silky as a Wade Graham and yeah. these sort of guys, but... And he just pulled the right rein every single time, Bobcat. Heartbeat of the club for a long time yep. too, wasn't he? And I remember the one memory I've got of Bobcat, I got to know him through like New South Wales Pathways and stuff like that. He does a lot of great stuff at the grassroots and, and kids coming through the Origin Pathways and stuff. But when he scored, was it in his last game and they were wearing the Superman yeah. shirts and he went to jump on the Bobcat and he yeah, slipped? slipped. <laughs> that was um, <laughs> like... A, like I don't know why I remember random shit like this, but like that's one moment where I, I remember. And then I remember the first time I met him, I was shaking his hand. I didn't, I didn't have the courage to say it to him, but the first thing that came to my mind was him running to celebrate and slipping on his ass, <laughs> getting on the bobcat, which is, which is quite funny. But that, when we spoke about the coolest jerseys, those jerseys were sick. Those Star, was it Star Wars? Star, I think they were Star Wars. Yeah, like yeah, they were cool jerseys, bro. But like he was, he he reminds me of like a Boyd Cordner slash Wade Graham. Mm. Like the same sort of mould, big, tough, robust, but could play a little bit as well. But his role on that team wasn't to, to pass and stuff. But when he did, you could tell he had the skills of a 5'8", of for sure. And as much as it's not his ball playing, I, I still think it, it is so underappreciated. That tackle that he made on the last play of the 04 grand oh, final. Oh, yeah. Mick Crocker is through for all money and that ankle tap. 
uh, a huge moment there. Mick Crocker's another fucking good ball playing forward. So. Tough as anything. He, too. he played 5 8 for the Kangaroos a couple of times, I'm pretty sure. How many times did he go for a charge down and get knocked out to? <laughs> Talk about one percenters. He was always yeah. there, wasn't he, Croc? Mick Crocker. Uh, boys, anyone else you want to throw in there? That we uh, I got mention? one. I, so ferocious running the ball, but willingness to throw an offload. Ben Kennedy. Mm. Oh, the grouse, yeah. He was one of, I mean, I think Joey still calls him one of Newcastle's best signings. Like, yeah. he was, yeah, he I was so good. Newcastle's best signing. I think he's Manly's best Yeah, signing. definitely Manly as well. Yeah. He could have won the Clive in 2001. He was so good that day. He was, he would have been great to play with. How, how big was Ben Kennedy? You know, is it, is it up there? Because, like, it. when you watch him, like, stand on the footy field, he looks like one of those guys that's six foot seven. Obviously, he's not, but the way he, he could get a team and literally carry him on his back couldn't he yep. like he was that kind of play where he just went oh fuck it follow me see he's 6'2 and 107 kilos yeah see I'll, I'll, if I looked at him I would say you're 6'4 easy but mm. like yeah he just never shirked the hard stuff did he he could do the pretty stuff like running a bit wider and score tries but through the middle like he'd just be all bash and barge and courage and, and toughness like well it's crazy how much they put that the success that Manly had down to his two seasons that he was there, where mm. Manly did fuck all in those two years. But he took Anthony Watmo, he took Glenn Stewart under his wing, yep. and they just exploded over the next few years. Yep. Uh, I think he, he played there for two seasons, and I think a few years later, Manly named their team of 50 years. They picked Ben Kennedy in it, despite only playing two years there and being not being very successful, but he laid the platform yep, for well the comps they won. Shows you what type of player and person yep. and, and leader he is, so like, if you're held in that high regard, especially the club like Manly, who's had so many great players, like just goes to show what a good player he was. I had um, I had one, I had a couple, but one that I felt like I needed to mention was Sean O'Loughlin. Um, I've got some of Locker's stats here. I, I was lucky enough to play with with Sean the last two years of his career at Wigan Warriors, where he played 458 games for for huh. Wigan. He's from Wigan. He's a Wigan lad. One one town, one club player. 25 tests for England, 11 for Great Britain, four grand finals, two Challenge Cups. And Sean O'Loughlin, I remember I've watched countless hours of him playing, obviously doing video review against him, but just I've been a fan of the Super League for a long time watching him play. There's two moments of Sean O'Loughlin's illustrious career that stand out for me. One was against St Helens, the derby they call it over in the Super League at Magic Weekend, where Blake Green goes to the line, shows... Has lockers on his inside. Greeny was obviously playing six. Sean, 13. Pops it to him. Makes a break. in the clear. Like, this is a big human that plays in the middle of the field. And he goes to skim the fullback, left to right, mind you, and has a player by the name of Dan Sargentson on the right wing for Wigan Warriors. The easiest thing to do was probably get tackled for someone like lockers of his size and, and strength and things like that, or to kick it. Like, that would have been the easiest way to get the ball there. But he just decided to to get the fullback close enough to engage him so he obviously couldn't check and get off and throws this Hail Mary left to right, I reckon 25 to 30 metres. So from near black dot to the sideline and hits Sargentson on the chest at full flight. Like, I mean, tight spiral torpedo to hit the winger. For a guy that would have played 60 minutes in the middle, like 30-odd tackles, 15, 20 hit-ups, touched the ball twice a set, to be able to do that was was special and there was another one um, against Warrington in the semi-final at the DW and Wigan where he breaks down a play of the back row or front row to get a quick play of the ball about 10 metres out with a minute I'll say 30 seconds to go they were behind flies down the short side pushes a half out the way has a four on four double pump hits Joe Burgess who goes over in the corner to send them to Old Trafford I think they ultimately go on a win too so he's someone that I was lucky enough to play with I would probably say Arguably the greatest player I got to play alongside in terms of what he did in his career. That's both in NRL and Super League. And he's someone that when I look at his career, I know that how proud he is to be a Wiganer and, and to play for Wigan. And I just wish that the NRL got to see him play in, over on these shores too. I was at the Roosters when they played Wigan at the 2014 World Club Challenge after they won it in 13. And obviously Trent Robinson's a mastermind and coached in the Super League and would have coached against Sean on a number of occasions. And I remember the video sessions um, were going for like half an hour, 45 minutes, something like that. And 25, it was on Sean O'Loughlin and what he did with the football. He was that dominant and that good for Wigan. He obviously played with blokes like Paddy Richards, who went over there and had a fantastic career. Sam Tompkins obviously had Greeny, but he was just so, so good. Like one of England's all-time greats and 
Um, I know a lot of people in our role wouldn't have got to see him play or know much about him, but um, yeah, as a former teammate, he's right up there with some of the like one of the best I've ever played with. Now, Matty, I thought you would have picked John Sutton twice. I'm surprised the name hasn't come up yet. Yeah, I just I didn't want to seem too biased. Nah, I I did think about Johnny Sutton, and he's definitely right up there for me. Um, but I I don't want to just keep naming South people. You'd hate to be that South guy, right? <laughs> That'd be awful. <laughs> The one other guy I want to ask you about, and I, I assume you would have played against, maybe with, I don't know, in England. I thought he left the NRL way too early. Adam Cuthbertson. Oh yeah, mate. He yeah. um, did he win a Man of Steel? No, he made, did he win a Man of Steel or did he go top three? There was one year that, um, I think Zach Hardacre, my mate Zach, won it, but he said that the he won it only because of Adam Cuthbertson. I think it was those two in the final from Leeds with another player. I think he was a top three candidate anyway. I played against him at the back end of his career when he was at Leeds still, and he held the ball like that, mm. could pass like that, could pass like that, and he was just such a handful. He's one of those guys that you'd go to the ground with and he'd hand grenade it out the back, but it wasn't just a loose pass where he was just hoping it'd hit someone. The Leeds, the way Leeds play is so free and off the cuff and attack you from everywhere – the hooker and the fullback, whenever he touched the ball, would just be either side of him. So he had the license to just launch it back. And the amount of times that uh, Matt Parcell, when he first went over there and won a comp, you know how quick Matt Parcell is, obviously, it just get into his hands or Zach Hardacre's hands and they'll just go straight through the line and score. Phenomenal talent. And, yeah, I agree. Left he the NRL way too I was going to mention. I could not believe when Cuthbo and Parcell left. They both left way too early, in my opinion. Yeah, well, I just – I saw an instant the other day, Matt Parcell's 30. Oh, I, I don't I, – I thought he was my age. <laughs> I can't believe he's 30. But, like, he's still killing it for Hull Kingston Rovers. Matt Parcell, dummy half, so fast. Just got that unbelievable speed off the mark. When Like, Damien Cook, like, when you pick mm. it up and, they, and they're just gone like that. Mm. But I suppose people just do what they got to do. And um, they both carved out great Super League careers as well. And they both did their thing in the NRL. And for one reason or another, decided to stay over there and, and, and play. I, I think Cuthbo is still playing... Maybe super, uh, maybe championship. Um, last time I saw, he was playing for York, I think. But I don't know if he's he's still playing. He's got him as up. Featherstone Rovers. Featherstone here. Rovers, that's it. Sorry, yeah. So I don't know if he's hung him up now or he's still playing. But um, one hell of a career, man, for sure. Yeah, he was on the awesome. shortlist. You're right for the yeah. man still. Yeah, yeah, because I'm Zach's a good mate of mine, and I think he won it that year. Did Zach yeah. win it that year? And he said he wouldn't have been a, a candidate if it wasn't for Cuffison. They reckon the amount of times that he got his arm through the line and Zach was playing fullback and he just come off his shoulder and, and take the fullback on and score or set someone else up was a joke. So he definitely deserves a shout for best ball playing forward. Now, obviously, uh, a lot of the guys we've spoken about are guys from the past, but are we blessed at the moment with the golden eras of, of 13s? Yeah, I reckon. Uh, like, we, we spoke about it off air a little bit. Isaiah is probably the one that everyone looks to in terms of getting the balance right. Like, the one thing about that I love about Isaiah Yo, will love watching, is he doesn't shirk the tough stuff either. You know what I mean? He doesn't get caught up with just ball playing, ball playing. He scores a lot of tries for a middle forward, but he also sets a hell of a lot up. He makes Nathan and Jerome's job a hell of a lot easier, but he also helps his middle middle pack out by taking them hard yards. Like you look at him, he'd probably average, I don't know his averages, but like 140 metres, 40 odd tackles, doesn't get hurt, robust, resilient. And he went from being did he start off as, as a centre or a back? Yeah, centre back role. Yeah. yeah. Went into the middle and Really, like, I feel like Jake Trebojevic doesn't get enough praise for... He was that real good ball play in 13 that sort of everyone sort of moulded their game on how Jake played. And then Isaiah probably took it to another level. But you got him, Jake, Cam Murray now, who's got a great pass. Like, he went from that in behind the line, hit the ground, play the ball quick to an unbelievable passer of the football. There's another half for the Rabbitohs in good ball. I feel like Victor, like... Victor's probably my favourite to watch in, in, in terms of the way he played. Like, I'm watching him play for England and he's doing stuff really well, like catching the ball wide but not holding it for too long, just catching it, tipping it, letting the other middle lay the line for him to come back with that big play with George Williams. The other middle leading off him, George Williams at the back using his speed to skip across the line. But then you've got people that do it differently, like Jason Tamalolo. Like, he's left to right pass in that semi final this year that hit the hit Peter Hickey on the chest at full speed was a joke. Like for someone that plays the game at that high intense, just bash, barge, right foot, bump, get out of my way. 
make 200 metres a game, to be able to be in the washing machine, I think the game was near overtime when he threw the pass. It was to get him into overtime maybe. Yep. Mm. And to throw it 20 metres on the fly and hit Peter Hickey at full, full, full steam ahead. We're, we're, yeah, as you said, we're blessed with like talent at 13. Paddy Carrigan's another one that is, get, is getting that pass in his game, that tip on, that out the back. Every team these days probably needs one, but like they all do it in different ways. Like Jazz Tavanga from the Warriors does it different to everyone else, but does it so well. Like he's got that subtle tip, but like run the ball at anyone. I don't know, man. Like this generation of 13 slash props, there's always one or two in the team that really have that skill about them to, to help complement the halves and other people on the side. So I think the Sharks have a good rotation with Dale and Cam McGuinness as well. Are they interchanged with each other? Like Dale's a bit more... Uh, run hard and then Cam McGuinness comes on and he's got a bit of creativity but he's still tough as fuck. So. Yeah. Yeah, and you've got to be able to pass. It's almost like a requirement these days. Like mm. Every team I've played in, one or two people in the middle, don't take it upon themselves, but are the two that really have to lead the way with getting the other forwards involved. Like You see it at the Raiders, like uh, Papali and, and, and Joey Tarpany, like the way they link together as well is unreal. They won't just run it for the sake of running it. If, if one's free outside, they'll tip. And Ray Gouler and, and that off the bench as well also have a great pass too. I think Canberra do it really well. There's a lot of – Junior Paulo for a big man oh, yeah. can can pass with the best of them. So, I mean, every team in the comp has a ball playing middle now that, that can do it. But the scary thing is when you come up against those real, real big packs that have one or two big units that you know are going to run for 140 that you have to be courageous and get in front of – but you also need to be smart and good ball that you can't race off the line to shut them down because they've got that short tip and another big middle flying off their off their shoulder too. So just shows how far the game's gone, going from bash and barge to you need to be able to do both, have the finesse and, and, and the passing game too. So um, I'm not going to pick who the best is at it, but I've just named nearly everyone in the comp. So <laughs> take oh, your I pick. think it's incredible though as well that how – like. Like all, all the guys that we've spoken about today, you could have watched them in their first 50 games of first grade and gone, they're ball playing forwards. Mm. Whereas now, I feel like there's like a Jason Tamalolo for the first eight years of his career, hardly passed a football. Mm. And then in the last two years, all of a sudden it's really developed. Cam Murray, Matty, he's the same. I cannot mm. believe how much of a good link man he has become in the last, especially this year. I, I feel like we, we didn't talk about it enough. Did, did, did you notice that in his game? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, he's he really stepped that part of it up this year. As you said before, like, you know, he had the quickest play the ball in the comp and still does, but now he's evolved as a as a ball playing forward oh, as well. I reckon he's a big part of the reason why your attack was okay without Adam Reynolds. He really stepped up this year playing that um link man sort of role. And there was a period of time there where um Ilias wasn't crossing um the the fifty percent mark for the first half of the season. Mm. Cam Murray was just controlling it on both sides of the rock. And what I respect so much about these boys that went from being that bash and barge, we need you to run 150, 200 metres, play the ball quick for our halves to play, to the boys that are link men now. We're talking about Cam Murray, so I'll use him as an example. If you actually watch Cam Murray, catch the, he catches the ball real early out in front. Like He's got a real early catch for someone that's used to just like hitting the ground hard, playing it fast, and letting these halves do, do everything. He catches the ball early and he... And he holds it in two hands always. And he's got that late tuck. So when he w go, wants to go on the line, he can bump that outside man, drop that shoulder and poke his nose through and play it. Or he's got that real uh, good deception in his game now where he's got the ball out in front. He's looking out the back. He can either hit short out the back or because he's got an early catch in two hands and he can see what the defence is doing in front of him. He can actually show and, and get in behind. Like With South, you know that they're going to go to their left. But with Cam Murray and Cody and Latrell, they're that good. They're that elite at what they do. It doesn't matter that you know it's coming. You can't stop it. Like it's proven that you can't stop it. They're they're so good. They're so well drilled. They're so elite at it. And Cam's a massive part now. Obviously, Adam was a big part of it. And, and Lockie Elias really started to find his straps. And he done so well to bounce back from from what he the bit of adversity that he faced. You got to respect like a young kid to bounce back from that's outstanding. But I feel like Cam Murray and Cody and Latrell on that left edge, the way they link together is is so good to watch. Hard to play against, but so good to watch. I would say over the last two years, I think Isaiah Yo's taken it to a new level that we haven't seen. Obviously, just I, I think he's by far and away the most consistent out of all of them. Mm. I, I can't remember a time when Isaiah Yo a pass has hit the ground. Yeah, it just doesn't happen. Whereas, I think Victor Radley, I think he's the most naturally gifted thirteen in our game, mm. but he's obviously spends a lot of time off the field. I, I, we've said it on bloke a lot. I think Radley's biggest downfall and the thing that's going to make that is 
going to make it so hard in his career is that if he wasn't suspended or injured during the last two years, I reckon he'd already have six State of Origin games. It's great to see him playing for England. He's doing very well. But I reckon he would have already played for New South Wales. That two-year period, he gave Isaiah Yeo every opportunity to show what he could do. And Isaiah Yeo took it with both hands. He also gave Cam Murray every opportunity to show what he can do. Um, I, I really hope the international game does keep going the way it is because I want to see Radley go head-to-head with Isaiah Yeo and Cam Murray for the next few years. Yeah, and, and the one thing I res- I've always loved about Victor, I got to play with him in the under-20s at the Roosters. Like, there were some games that he got called upon to play 5-8, and he just didn't look out of place. Like, he could play six at the drop of a hat. He get he jumps into nine for England to spell Mickey McAlorum and, and sets up tries for England. And then for someone that's not that big, overly tall, obviously, and, and he's probably not – I haven't seen him up close for, for a long time now. I haven't played against the Roosters for a while. But the way he hits for someone of that, that size is a joke. Like, to get through the work he does – but he controls their attack so well at the Roosters. Like you can, you can see now even for England that he's pointing and getting people around the park. He's demanding that you lay that line so I can come back with this play. Or if you're not going to lay it, I'll lay it. But get me over there so we can come back with our big shot. He's just become such an all-round elite talent that, um, yeah, I, I get such a joy out of watching him play because he's just a pure footballer. You know, you could chuck him in any era as well, Victor. Mm-hmm. You could chuck him in the 70s. You could chuck him in the 80s. You could probably drink with the best of them. But he can bang with the best of them, and he can and he can ball play with the best of them. So I'm not saying he's the best, but I won't, I won't name one. I have got to play against all these guys, and they'd all knock my head off my shoulders. So I'll leave that for someone else to debate. But they're all they're all freaks in their own right, and and they've made the game so much more competitive and and, and great to watch. Like as you said with Victor, like he's he, he's 24 or, or, or 25. Maddie, can you check how old he is? Yeah. I think he's 24. But as you said, he's pointing, telling everyone to go. Go back and watch those 18 and 19 grand finals. Cooper Cronk's on the field. Victor's doing the same thing. Yeah. He was 20 years old then. Yeah, he's 24 now. 24. There's a moment in the 2019 grand final where he subs on, you see him sprint onto the field, and as he runs to the ruck, he hits Jared and Takiyaho on the ass, and he yells something at him. The next play, you see him put Takiyaho straight through a go- straight through a gap, and, and they go 50 metres. Just an absolute... And that's against that. That Canberra Raiders defence was incredible. Yeah. Well, watch him... Oh, if you guys, you will obviously watch the the semi-finals coming up. But just watch yeah. England and and a lot of people get plaudits. Like George Williams is playing out of his skin. Young Jack Wells be at six. Sam Tompkins is is a great ball player at the back. But their attack revolves around Victor and what he's doing. And he he he's a humble he's a humble guy, Vic. He he would never he would never claim anything like that. But he is the key to them going on and and winning the World Cup. Like if he if he's at his top level and he's playing. Uh, best lock in the world kind of football and, and what we know Victor can. I think England are a real shaker winner. But I've just been really impressed at waking up and just watching how he gets people across the field because the one thing about him is that we all know is he doesn't shirk the tough stuff either. Like He gets the balance right between I'm going to be Victor the Inflictor where he got the nickname where he's going out there bruising, bashing people, kick pressure and inside pressure and intimidating into that finesse ball player where England are running 40 to 60 points every week. So... It's pretty impressive to watch. They're like the the three we named, Yo, Murray, and and Radley. They all probably do one thing better than the other, but their all around games just are, are so so good. I can't wait to see Radley and and Murray in about four years time, in twenty eight, sort of starting to hit the what should be their peak. I think it's going to be scary. If England play Australia in the final, do you reckon Victor's taking that personal? One hundred percent. Well, I know. Well, I know the answer is yes, but yeah. like I just. I, I would love for the camera to be just on Victor as he's walking out. The emotion, obviously, of representing your heritage, how proud his dad is of him. He talks about the Yorkshire blood. But then to go against two guys that were battling him for the origin slash Australian jerseys and then one guy in Cam that he's played since he was seven years old in the Eastern Suburbs competition, I think you'll see um, the best of, of all three of them, which will mm. be unbelievable to, to watch. Sit back on your couch and watch. It, it should make... For a good game, but in saying that, they've they've got to get there first. Obviously, New Zealand are unbelievable, and and Samoa aren't going to go down without a fight as well. So, should be a good next couple of games. Uh, that's part of the narrative that I love with Radley and Cam Murray. You've got Cam Murray; he's a mascot jet. South Sydney Junior Victor Radley is a Cloverly Crocodile, and I, I reckon there's going to be a point in five or six years where, well, obviously Cam Murray, he's already the the um, captain of South Sydney. For me, I think Rads is probably the next captain of the Sydney Roosters. I think he'd deserve it and suit it as well. Like. Yeah. Um, 
yeah, he he's followed in the footsteps of blokes like Jared and Siwa and Mitch Orbison and, and blokes like this that have been great leaders. And from all accounts, he's really close to Teddy, who was formed into arguably the best leader in, in football at the moment, captaining state and country. So, I mean, uh, he, he's obviously had different battles in, in terms of off-field stuff, which we, which we all go through growing up. It's a part of learning. And you can tell that he's really matured. Like, I, I love listening to his interviews now, Victor. He... He doesn't always try and be the larrikin that he once was. He's got that side of him and you never want him to lose it because that's what makes him and, and people like Brandon Smith the people that they are and the marketable people that they are. But he's got that real maturity uh, maturity, sorry, and sense in purpose and when he talks and yeah, it's a it's a it's a big it's a big thrill to watch him not only um, mature as a player but a person too, and it's great to see. Boy, is there any other ball playing forwards you want to throw in there before we hit the frog and toad, Matty? Oh, I can't think of any You done and dusted? Jacko? I'm done and dusted. Yeah, because I could keep talking. I've got about <laughs> 10 English blokes that I could name. Kevin Sinfield, that West Andy Tigers Farrell. Third, eh? <laughs> Looking at Rooster. <laughs> I wouldn't say that. <laughs> He's a battler. He's a battler. We love it. Uh, guys, thanks for joining us once again on the off-season. We will be back uh, next week. We'll let you know what time that episode is dropping and what our topic will be. I think we're going to get stuck into utilities the best utilities of all time. A lot of you guys have been asking for that. Uh, so stay tuned for that. Plenty more content coming. Cheers, guys.